Good afternoon, family and friends from the homesteading grandparents, and welcome to another Swing and Swat session. As promised in previous days, Pops has agreed to come and set in with us today and share a little bit of his life growing up in the early 30s, 40s, 50s, somewhere yeah. along in there and uh, throughout that time period. So that's what we're going to do today. And kind of gave him a little heads up, but this is going to be off the hip and we're just going to ask questions yeah. and, and uh, start hearing some of the, the way life used to be. So dad, you grew up, we, well, you was born 19 and 31. Right. And the fall of that year? October. And then you had, um, let's see, you had your siblings. How many siblings you have? Mom had two boys when her and dad married. They were small. Uh, of course, don't remember the exact ages, but then there were five of us children. I had a sister older, a sister younger, and then two brothers. Uh, the last one came along 11 years behind me. Okay. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, of course, obviously don't remember the early 30s, but I do feel like that I can go back uh, four and five years old with, without question. And uh, yes, you had mentioned earlier that mules, uh, we farmed, we, we lived on a farm, a uh, small farm. Uh, of course, then if you had 18, 20 acres, would you, Farming with mules, well, that was a pretty good size because it take you a long time with a pair of mules to plow that many acres. Mm -hmm. But uh, did grow up in, with mules. Uh, I was probably five years old because I remember the planter the pew, pulled by an old mule, Jerry, never forget that name. And uh, it had a hopper and I would fill it about half full of corn because I couldn't handle it. It got top heavy and the old mule knew what to do. He just pulled the planter and my only job was to hold that planter upright. He got to the end of the row. He knew how to turn around and go back on the next one. And I can, uh, I had to reach up to get a hold of the handlebars to hold the planter up. And so I just grew, I came into this world working, you know, and that's about all I remember. But uh, it must have been late 30s, maybe early 40s, we got a tractor. And of course, that's the beginning of World War II. And there were some pretty drastic changes in the economy from uh, my early, early days uh, to when some of the other siblings came along. But uh, we formed with mules and then we did it at one point in time. We kind of came up in the world, we had two tractors. Uh, there were two row, two row equipment. Uh, you can compare that to the 24 row equipment that they have today. Mm. Uh, but uh, we could, we formed quite a bit more because we easily doubled our acreage. and. Uh, I spent my life, uh, we grew corn in, in uh, Milo. And the Milo was primarily for feed. We did not market that, but corn was our cash crop. Okay. And uh, that, uh, of course, that came along in the fall of the year. We would sell some of it green, uh, take it into Houston, uh, which was uh, an awful long way away then, because 70 miles. And some of the vehicles we had back then was a pretty good trip. Uh, but most of it we harvested dry and uh, sold it then for feed. And we used it for uh, uh, the corn especially. Uh, we fed the animals, the chickens, uh, but we also uh, ground the corn for a meal, corn meal. Mm -hmm. We had an old grist mill. I learned how to run that. And we'd, uh, that, by then we got the power take off on the tractor. And, uh, but uh, I learned how to co uh, cornmeal, and we called it chops for the chickens. It was just coarser ground. 
but uh, you know we still have chops today i bought some here a couple of weeks ago over I the feed store wondering if they still <laughs> called it chops well, sure do yeah yeah they just ground up corn so you you've shared a story with us before too where um your mom mamma as we actually called her yeah. and she would give you a little warning every time you went out to grind corn what what was that uh i thought about that as i was talking and uh, <laughs> yes it was i'm being the irish when irish lady that she was and she was a lady but she was pretty stern don't scorch that cornmeal <laughs> meaning that if you get those stones as they roll together to crush the grain uh it would build up heat and it would actually scorch the corn and you could smell it. And I don't know how far away she could smell it, but she knew when <laughs> I had messed up. And of course, I, I got to, I learned that, uh, okay, when you smell the scorch, that goes in the chicken feed and you start over. And that could probably mean going back to the barn, shucking some more corn, cleaning it up, getting all the silk off of it, Nubbing it, as we call it, you take the two ends off that that's, may have some bad grain on it, and then you shell the rest of it. And uh, what was the word we used? Winter it, where you just hold it up in the wind and let it blow through mm -hmm. and get all the chaff dust off of it. And uh, then it could go into the, into the grinder. So how'd y'all shell the corn? By hand. Now, later we got a two ear job, you cranked it by hand, but you could two of you and you one feeding the two ears in there and it would shell two ears at a time and it just kind of spun it. Uh, so we could use that for cornmeal and for the chops and those things. It didn't hurt if you broke a grain. Now, uh, getting seed corn was a different story. You do that strictly by hand. Dad, came into play there and uh, I was encouraged very strongly you just shell that by hand do not put it in that sheller uh, because that would crack the grain which would affect uh, that germinating but uh, we did shell most of it by hand so it you know nowadays we when we get ready to plant corn or whatever we go to the feed store or we find us a seed house and we go buy it right, right. yeah well back then y'all y'all kept y'all seed year to year year to and, year and you know and i can remember big daddy keeping um cush all seed mm -hmm. year to year and uh, maybe some of the squash or cucumbers but specifically the cush all but y'all kept it year to year and how how many pounds of seed or what i mean how'd y'all determine how much seed you was going to keep i i really don't know a uh, dad had some way I'm sure because he would tell me how many sacks of seed corn he wanted mm -hmm. okay. and uh, there again uh, and and we would would nub we called it nub and you'd take a a cob that was already sure where you'd already shell the, the kernel off of it and you use that hold it in your hand and uh, keep in mind I'm left-handed and uh, nub that with that to keep from rubbing blisters on your hand Mm -hmm. which that would do pretty quick mm -hmm. and uh, we used that that went into the chops and what have you but uh, he wanted nothing but uh, a full clean kernel so by the time you get an ear and the ears then were not as big as some of the corn that we can grow today with the fertilization and everything mm -hmm. we have but uh, you get it down and you've probably got six inches of corn left on that cob and that, you can get a lot of grain and I we kind of did that in the winter time and it was not that much of a deal to get seed yeah. corn so y'all planted mostly what we call field corn or sweet corn the the uh, strain of corn then was two spin it was a field corn okay and the two spin was uh, because the stalks were real tall uh, because as a kid, I would have to pull the stalk down, uh, which if, when it's dry, you're breaking it over and uh, to help harvest. So all that was done by hand too? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. We uh, 
uh, first we had mules that was pull the wagon. Uh, we didn't have a iron wheel wagon. Dad had built the trailer some way, but it it was a four wheel trailer with a tongue and and you could guide it that way. Uh, and it had rubber tires on it, so uh, that was better than a lot of our neighbors had. But we uh, harvested by hand and. With the width of the trailer, you're going to knock down one row, so mm -hmm. that was called the down row, and I got the down row mm -hmm. because I'm quite small then. And uh, you're still ten years old or less at that oh, point. Oh, le less, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And probably by the time I'm getting ten years old, we had the tractors, and. Uh, one year in particular that I recall, I missed 53 days of school. Dad served on the school board. It was a real small school district. Dad was on the board. It had, had one teacher, one room schoolhouse. And uh, he worked a deal where my younger sister brought my homework home every night. And when I'd come in from the field, I would bathe, eat supper. And then Esther and I would get my lessons for the for that day, and she would take them to school with her the next day. It was right there in the community, and uh, it's the only year that I recall missing that much. And we were approaching the time by then. By the time I'm in my early teens, uh, Dad was working out some uh, carpenter work. There was an oil company, Superior Oil. And somewhere he got uh, a connection with uh, one of the superintendents in that and uh, worked over at Sugar Valley. That's a little community between Old Ocean where we lived, which was at that time Chances Prairie. It didn't even have a name of Old Ocean. Bay City, there was a 16 mile uh, different, I mean, distance between those two. And uh, he worked for them. And uh, I don't have any idea how much uh, he made. Uh, it was uh, 50 cents a day to a dollar and a half a day on, for the farm workers. Yeah. And uh, two in the winter time when we were doing nothing, uh, the, I don't know where I say that word right, size and graph where they came through then to try to locate oil, they would drill holes, set off a charge and they could determine their what the chances were. And Dad would farm a team of mules in that trailer out to haul their equipment back through the mud because uh, a lot of it in the wintertime was mud mm -hmm. and they was going back to wooded areas and everything. A lot of palmetto back in those. Plenty of palmetto. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember you telling me too with the corn that back then you, you mentioned that, you know, there's not a lot of fertilization and that y'all would y'all would space y'all's seed or the corn close to a foot apart was it is that right a foot apart or yes uh, i recall there were uh, seven or eight whole plate that would go in that planter and i don't know uh what the relation was and is that wheel turn and turn that mm -hmm. plate and drop that kernel of corn out but they would be about a foot apart and then we chopped those out to about two feet apart. Mm. And, and today, you know, what, oh well, it looks like yeah hair on a dog's back, so to speak. You know, you yeah, know. it's it's a whole lot closer because we use a lot a lot of more uh, commercial fertilizer yeah, on our crops. Ammonia, then, and, uh, yeah. fertilization today. Uh, we had no fertilization then uh, outside of animal waste. But, and in, in there again, we did not actually put this out there, just mm -hmm. as what was there during the grazing time during the winter mm -hmm. months. And then you plow that in. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had no, no fertilization. We didn't know, I didn't know what fertilizer yeah. was. You, you've told me about when you was carrying that planter or working with a planter at that real young age, something happened one time. What tell us what? <laughs> Something <laughs> happened a number of times. <laughs> and there's a lot of stories that uh, was generated uh, to that, but I never did try to defend my case. I just let it be because it didn't make any difference. <laughs> but 
I mentioned earlier, I would fill that hopper, and I don't, it, it was probably 10 inches in diameter. It was bigger than a gallon bucket, but it was kind of tall, and I could fill it up about halfway, but if I filled it all the way, which I would love to do, because then I don't have to stop, and that would put me behind Dad, because he's opening up the row with the team of mules, and then I got to finish up after he's gone to the house, and that was a horrible 15 <laughs> or 20 minutes, you know. And, <laughs> Uh, but I'd get it too full. Jerry goes out to the end of the row, and all he knows to do is turn around and go back in the other row. And I would lose control of that. It falls over. The corn dumps out. Well, as soon as the planter fell over, Jerry stopped. <laughs> and then I go to trying to pick the corn up. Well, I don't want to get too much dirt in there with it, you know. That would plug up the holes in the plate where the uh, feeding out the corn, the kernels. Uh, and I'd get all I could get, I felt, without getting a lot of dirt in there, and then I'd just cover up the rest and we'd go. Well, what happens? That corn is in the ground, it sprouts <laughs> like that. And uh, what they said there was that Dad had me, the, my siblings, said Dad had him out planting the skips in the corn and he'd get tired and bury the seed. <laughs> well, that was just a story that was generated. I did not do that because Dad knew that this, I'm gonna plant the skips because they're gonna come up mm -hmm. or they're not gonna come up. And he knew the difference. Mm -hmm. So yes, that was, uh, that was the biggest story that, that came out of me turning, losing control of the planter mm -hmm. and dumping out the seed. I can only imagine, because Noah is four, right? And we know how, how tall he is like well, this. And so, and what, uh, Abby's five. Of course, she's small, but I can only imagine that size of a child, you know, trying to hold up this, this planter, because like you said, it had to been up here and for a, a normal adult to be using it. I know that people don't, it's difficult for them to believe that it did that. And I was the only one in the neighborhood that I recall uh, working in that capacity. But as I look back on it in later years, uh, you know, I, I, others were out playing, doing things, and I'm working in the field. I was the only help Dad had. Mm -hmm. And there was no money to pay anyone else. The help that we would get, Mom had a, a lady that worked uh, for her occasionally. She ironed, uh, she, I don't recall her doing much housework. Okay. It was washing and hanging out the clothes and then ironing. That was the big thing. Lova was her name. Great, great lady. Uh, but. Hardly and do I remember a time that she left the house and they probably lived a quarter of a mile from where we did because it was a mixed community it was, mm -hmm. and it was I think the the blacks and the whites I don't remember any uh, Mexican at that time in mm -hmm. that community well I'm sure there was not uh, and we just grew up together I played with them I hunted with them fished with them and thought nothing about any of it right uh, they had I would act they could eat in our home but for some reason they were more comfortable with uh, dad would set up a table and mama would take the food out to them and they were much more comfortable eating out there uh, interesting yeah uh, during harvest time the the man that owned the land uh, would bring he out uh, Sweeney was six miles away from us, five miles. He owned a uh, kind of a mercantile store. They lived upstairs in this old building and just he and his wife, they had no children. And he would bring rows of uh, bologna, pressed ham, cheese, uh, those kind of things out for the workers to eat for lunch. Well, that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted mustard greens and cornbread and uh, pinto beans, and mm -hmm. uh, and mom cooked that, mm -hmm. and they loved 
uh, maybe she even get a little ham in there occasionally, you know, and they loved that. Well, us kids just go crazy because it wasn't the three of us at that time. Uh, we got the lunch meat and cheese. And <laughs> we we look forward to that, so yeah. they could have the red beans. <laughs> you eat that the rest of the year, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, we uh, fed them and. To say we just lived together and, and thought nothing about it. So, uh, Big Daddy, it was was quite a quite a man, uh, small in stature. Yes, small in stature, but, but very much a, a man man. And he had he was he was gifted, very as gifted. I recall, with a lot of what's what are some of the um, what are some of the jobs that you've already said he he was farming, okay and Bef well, before we leave the farm and let's share cropping, you, you talked about yeah, the gentlemen did. that own the property. So what, for maybe those that don't know what share cropping means, what, what did that mean? What, how'd that work? Well, it was, uh, he, it, it, well, the first tractor we had, he, furnished, he bought the tractor. The owner of the land. land. Yeah, the owner of the land okay. bought the tractor. Uh, and then the second tractor we had, dad bought it. But, uh, in harvest time, he uh, we had this wagon that we harvested in, and he got the first load, we got the second load, and then it was every other load. Okay. And that's the way. And Dad was honest to a fault. If if we wind would wind up, then there would be a half of load. You know, he made sure that Mr. Reynolds got at least half of that half a load that was mm -hmm. left. Very, very uh, conscientious about those kind of things. And and I just grew up that way mm -hmm. because uh, Dad was more about giving than receiving. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the sharecropping was 50-50. We did all of the work. He probably furnished, I think he might have bought some gasoline for the tractor. It seemed like that I remember uh, Dad saying Mr. Reynolds was paying for that. Because in World War II, when it came along, it started, uh, some of that, probably America started feeling some effects of that, and a historian could prove me wrong here, but like 1939, because they were already in war in Europe, some part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we first, we mean me, first recollection was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Okay. And that really threw us into World War II. And uh, things became rationed. And so we living on a farm, we got a lot more fuel than we actually needed. We had access to more fuel. And, but you would, for your vehicles, you would get a A stamp, a B stamp, or whatever, and that allotted you to X number of gallons of gasoline for a period of time. Uh, I'm saying that we, if we needed the gasoline, it was available. Now, Mr. Reynolds was probably buying that, but Dad would not use that gasoline for the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It was this, the stamps. Now, since it's so long past, I think I'm safe in saying that James did not always adhere to that. <laughs> by then, I knew how to go siphon the gas, and we didn't even have a pump to get it out of the barrel. We siphoned it out with a hose. And if the needle on that car was getting a little low, well, I was really not above getting some gasoline and putting it in the tank. <laughs> Dad probably didn't know about that. <laughs> but uh, it uh, we every, everything was ration sugar, flour, you name it. It was ration. Then you you you've uh, shared with us too the, with the family about that. Y'all knew that there was a depression yes. along that same time frame, right? Y'all knew that there was a depression, but how how did y'all how did y'all know that or? What were the circumstances around, or how did life look like with that? I guess what let me know that there was, there was, I didn't know it as a depression. 
I knew that men did not have a job. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a barn and we had garden, we had chickens, we had eggs, we had animals, we butchered the hogs, we butchered a calf. Uh, that was kind of an exception because uh, that was just kind of getting up if you could butcher one of your calves, you know, and have some beef. But uh, s- people just transit walking through, and this is out in the country, and just going maybe if West Columbia was a close town to walk back toward Houston, Bay City was farther south, and they would come and just stop see if there's anything we can do for food, place to sleep, let them sleep in the barn. No bathrooms, outdoor toilets, but uh, go to the well, pump your tub of water, bathe in that. Uh, but that's how we knew that the times were tough. And mm-hmm. money was just pretty much non-existent. Um, I don't really know how to describe that. People can't today cannot yeah. imagine no money. Right. What do you mean no money? Right. Well, I mean no money. No money. It's yeah. that simple. But yes, that's how I knew that uh, we were in some tough times. Yeah. And then uh, the defense workers was uh, there were a lot of Ro- President Roosevelt generated a lot of defense jobs, but they were to support the war. Everything went to supporting the war in the South Pacific and in Europe. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that we, I knew that times were getting more affluent. We had more. And see, especially uh, my two younger brothers, uh, they can't relate to that at all. Mm-hmm. Even though Aaron was born in 1934, I think they're about uh, things were beginning to change by then and there were probably more effects of the impending situation uh, had Im- an impact on where we were living how we were living then yeah. uh, they built that what is now the Phillips refinery at Old Ocean I remember when that was built and it was built initially for the higher octane gasoline for the airplanes. Cause Got you. And uh, so that was the first industry that we had in that in area. area. Yeah. So, and so kind of circling back to the jobs that Big Daddy had, you know, was farming, that you recall was farming and carpentry work. Mm-hmm. And um, didn't you tell us that one time he did some blacksmith? He had a blacksmith shop had the forge, the anvils, and those things. And that was uh, one, uh, where he would get some of the money was sharpening the plow points uh, for the neighboring farmers. Yeah. And he did that by heating and beating it out with a hammer. And that's the way he put the edge on it because there's no electricity to run a grinder. If you did anything to that, you did it with a file. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, then it farming the teams out, uh, the team. Uh, we, by then we had two teams of mules that he could work, work one in the morning and one in the evening. It was pretty tough on the animal, uh, even I knew then, because they come in and it's mud up to their hocks. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was pretty tough on them and he would switch teams at noon. Uh, I guess outside of the carpenter work, but Dad learned to do anything connected with the building. He did the plumbing. Uh, he was not real good at electrical. He did not like that. Might be where you got something. <laughs> yeah, because I don't like electricity either. <laughs> I like it because it gives me light, but I don't like working with it at all. Uh, my dad and my brother, they don't mind, and, but no, I, it's not me. I don't, I, I don't mind. So he, he, I'm a little curious with it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why I, I don't like it because I think I would be too curious. <laughs> but there's a story I could tell about that here on this house, but we're going to stick with our topic today. <laughs> um, so Big Daddy was self-taught. I mean, he didn't, 
Now, we won't go into details about his, his dad. His dad was not a family man uh, by no means. He was not okay. a provider. Uh, dad became the, the man of the house at a very early age. Okay. And he provided for the family. He had an older sister. Uh, my uh, aunt, Carrie Crossan, now was the oldest child. And then dad was next. Okay. Now they, I understand, and I learned this later years, that there was a, another boy in the family that I didn't know about. He died at an early age. Uh, and then another one that I remember vaguely, he was probably 16 years old when he was killed in a, believe it or not, an automobile train wreck. Hmm. Where it was probably the old T model he was driving making so much noise, and they didn't have railroad crossing signals. Right. Uh, yeah, you just be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he died in wreck, but, uh, well, that was pretty much it along those lines. Yeah. And then when did y'all have the milk route that you, you talked that about? That came right? along in World War II, and we did at one time, we had seven cows, seven milk cows. Dad milked four, and I milked three twice a day. And uh, milk was rationed uh, along mm -hmm. with other things. And of course, pasteurization, uh, that's when I first heard that, because we just drink raw milk, you know. Mm -hmm. Mom had a, a filtering device and she'd get these cloth filters and uh, where they call for one filter, she used two. Uh, mm -hmm. The milk was double filtered. And, uh, but uh, dead, the old car we had then, I don't remember what model it was, could have been a 29 Chevrolet, had a platform on the back where you put your luggage. Well, Dad built a box, a wood box, and he would put ice in that because there was an ice house in Bay City. And they would get blocks of ice and put in there. And uh, Mom got the bottles, and uh, it was a regular milk bottle with the cap that goes in it. And uh, we would, uh, Phillips, had a housing project uh, for that refinery, and we sold milk, regular milk route to that. Uh, I guess we did it every morning. Okay. And it was a pretty early thing. And we, we did have the milk route. Yeah. I don't know just how, I, well, uh, it, once the war ended, well, it, it began to get better because they were making more of whatever we needed. Uh, but uh, I don't remember that lasting but three or four years probably. Yeah. But we did it a good while. But you know, on a very, very small scale, uh, just a very, I mean, just a minute window here, I think we've seen a little bit of that with the pandemic, how things kind of got shut down and and I'm talking about modern conveniences like a refrigerator or a freezer. You had to place your order, and three or four months later, you may Thank get you. it six months. But like I say, it's a real small window. But that's kind of a parallel or a comparison. It definitely is. It definitely to maybe is. Maybe what you guys were seeing definitely. during the, the wartime. And maybe that's one reason that I didn't give too much thought to it. You know, it just, well, you had it yesterday, but you don't have it today. And you can see the light at the end of the tunnel next week or next month, and we will have it, yeah. uh, which was not the case back then. But yes, there's mm -hmm. definitely a parallel there yeah. to uh, to what the availability and uh, what you could do and what yeah. you couldn't do. And you know, only the good Lord knows, but we may be, you know, we may be headed back in that that direction to see some more of that and type stuff. I, I'm not. He only knows, but. Uh, he alone, he alone knows, but uh, yes, we definitely can. So th there was power, and what we'll, we'll kind of wrap this session up here for a l uh, here shortly, but y'all got power, and I believe you've stated that y'all were probably the first one on what y'all called the lane? Yes, it was called power. the lane. Okay, so how did y'all get power, and then <laughs> your, your aunt, that got well acquainted with that power. <laughs> oh. So how did y'all get power? Um, 
Dad, I don't know where he came up with this, but it was a generator. And it had an airplane propeller. We called it an airplane propeller. And that propeller must have been four feet long overall, maybe a little longer. Had this giant oak tree in our yard. Dad rigged, crawled up to the top of that, cut a top out of it, built a platform, and mounted this wind charger, as we called it. And it was nothing more than an airplane propeller type thing driving this generator. And out in the country like that, we always had a breeze, pretty much. Then he built on the side of the house a, a rack and got three or four batteries. They probably were not the best, but if you kept them charging all the time, they produced charge those generators, and that was the first electric light bulb in that house. Off of that, uh, I guess that was probably been DC current. I don't know really what it was. It made a light bulb burn. And uh, I remember Dad putting, I believe it was a 60-watt bulb in it and set it at Mom's sewing machine, and she said, that's too bright, it hurts my eyes. And so he put a 40 watt bulb in that, but we were the first ones. And the REA, which was the Rural Electric Authority, came in to play during World War II, uh, maybe started it before then. And uh, we got electricity. I don't. I can't say when we actually got yeah. electricity, but yes, we were the first ones on the lane to have electricity in the house. Now back to this clothesline deal. <laughs> yeah. Another one of Dad's inventions. He came up with this, uh, it was a it was a Sentry was the brand name of this electric motor. And he got a couple of small type bicycle wheels, made him an axle, a platform, and built some handlebars to it, and set this motor on that. And that motor was heavy. It was good stuff. And uh, went out, took a piece of pipe, and got the foot well bearing would go in the top and the bottom, shaft down to it, pull it up here, pull it down here. Took what was called a coulter, it's a blade that comes off a turning plow that's pulled by mules, and it rolls and it slices the soil, and then this uh, buzzard wing uh, device on this plow would roll it out. And had a shear cut there. Uh, took one of those, drilled holes in it, put four sickle blades on it, kind of ballasted it up as best he could, holding it on something flat, sharp, you know, and uh, bolted that to this shaft, come off of the electric motor, and because uh, you had to roll it because you're going from vertical to horizontal. Mm -hmm. Got that working. Now on to the story. Aunt Lily, which was Dad's youngest sister, Mom was sick, probably with another kid, you know. I don't remember just what the deal was there, but I remember this incident quite well. I'm mowing, and we had an old Romax cable that was the power cord for this. And we was pretty careful that whenever we found a bare spot, we'd tape it up. Well, I've got this thrown over the clothesline to kind of keep it up out of my way while I'm pushing it, because it was so hard to push, but I'm cutting weed. It beat a weed slinger all to pieces. And I remember, and Aunt Lily's hanging clothes on this line, and I remember uh, reaching up and catching my cord to pull it across. And evidently, well, evidently, a bear, the bare spot on that cable hit that clothesline. Aunt Lily had both hands on the clothesline at the <laughs> time, and I heard the scream. And I looked around, and both of her legs were drawn up, and she's in a knot under that clothesline. She's hanging from this clothesline. Well, I guess you could say God took over, and I jerked that cord 
not even without thinking, you know, I jerked the cord and it came off. Broke, and broke. And, and she it. hit the ground. <laughs> but let me go back to Mom was not sick. Dad was sick because Dad was in bed and he had on his pajamas and he came out. He healed up real quick. <laughs> he came out of that bed in his pajamas and went to Aunt Lily and helped her into the house. Yeah. So funny, funny to me, but I know it was. Well, one as we look back on it, it was hilarious because I still have that mental picture that I see today. She is. I, I was wondering how that clo and it didn't seem like it was sagging down, but she was. Her feet was three feet off the ground. Yeah. So to, tie, to tie all that together, the 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 uh, lawnmower that Big Daddy had built, Daddy described how he built all of that. They they connected that to that generator, or often batteries off the side of the house, where they get the power from the generator, and that's how it, he was cutting grass around. There. And that's how he's doing. It. Had that cable went up over that clothesline. <laughs> yeah, that had to be an interesting. Yeah, the what the the Romax that we see today, and it was called Romax then, but it had a cloth wrapping on it and. It, yeah. Pretty crude, <laughs> but I remember it. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, let's, uh, I've taxed you, taxed you pretty good here, so. Um, well, I hope, I hope that it kind of ties together and makes some sense because. Oh, yeah. You got to keep in mind that that's been several years back that <laughs> this took place, you know. <laughs> well, hopefully we can, we can get together again because uh, Dad has, he's, you know, he's got more stories associated with his time growing up that are always enjoyable for me anyway to hear. I really enjoy hearing about that time and how things were done. And of course, his dad, how creative he was. And, and dad's real creative. He's got a creative mind. And uh, I, I, lost, I didn't get that. I, I didn't lose it. I didn't get it. I can look at something and replicate pretty well but to think outside the box and find out, okay, so how am I going to address this problem? Um, I, I didn't didn't get that where uh, Pops and, and Big Daddy did. I guess you could call it gifted by necessity, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, you just you had you had no options. Yeah. Yeah. Mother is the or, or necessity is the it's mother, mother of invention. invention. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's how y'all and, and Dad. Uh, my dad never did talk about his dad, but some of the other family members were quite vocal. Uh, but dad was just one to not talk about other people. And so he didn't, but mm -hmm. I, I got most of mine from other sources and, and certainly didn't from dad. Yeah. yeah, he just wouldn't do it. Well, we'll talk more about them too, because um, yeah, I can remember Mamaw being, well, I remember it being just very jovial and um, always cooking. We'd go over there and eat. You know, her grandkids would go over there and eat on some Sundays. In fact, there were quite a few Sundays growing up. Cousins, oh, my yeah. cousins would be there, and we'd. But then, as Daddy said, Big Daddy was a very given, a very given man. gave He he gave. He I guess he he would have given everything away. I mean, he just. And in his later years. Uh, when he was no longer able to work and he had accumulated something, he gave it to the kids. Yeah, just just give, just give. Sure. But um, hopefully we can we can get back together again and hear some more from Pops. And hopefully you have enjoyed this as much as I have. Of course, it's very personal for me. And if you remember, if you've watched any of our previous videos, you remember one of our goals for starting this channel was to capture information from my family's history and, and have that for years to come for our children, but also to share those times with you all and then build a community um, you know, of, of grandparenting. So this is one of, the, one of those goals. And today we're, you know, we're fulfilling part of that goal and hopefully we can get together and, and capture some more of your history and time and, you know, and, and pull it together, and I don't want, I, you know, I, I've said you because you're the more talkative one between you and mom, 
<laughs> I haven't even talked to mom about this to start trying to capture some of her side. <laughs> but, uh, you know, talk with, with Nan and, and some of her family, and I think we can get some of them. But, um, you know, this is our starting point right here to get, get pop. So. so we really appreciate you all taking time to be with us today and, and share in this, this session and of Swing and Swat. And uh, if you like this, please give us a thumbs up. And of course, share, share the channel with your friends and subscribe. Those of you may, who may not have subscribed, please subscribe or at least consider it. And until next time, uh, God bless and you all take care. We're gone.